Okay, why don't we, um, why don't we get going. Um, thank you all for attending the, um, this is not the fourth or the fifth Kidwell lecture. The fourth Kidwell, John, John Kidwell Memorial Lecture. Um, I'm Jonathan Lipson. I teach at Temple Law School, um, and it's my privilege to be, I guess, the MC. I don't know what you call me today. I'm, I'm sort of managing traffic here, I think, mostly. Um, I wanted to um, uh, start. Um, we're all here, obviously, to see, hear uh, Bill Whitford talk about his paper on uh, default rules. Um, uh, but before we get to that, I wanted to do a couple of quick things. Um, first, I wanted to um, thank both old friends who are joining us again and new friends who are here for the first time, and in particular, um, thank those who have traveled uh, some distance to join us. So we've got Claire Hill, who's come from Minnesota. We've got Sarah Waldeck, who's joining us from the wilds of New Jersey. Um, we have Juliet Kostritsky from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, Case Western. David Gabler from uh, Case West, uh, I'm sorry, Northern Illinois, and Josh Whitford from uh, New York. So thank you all for coming in uh, for today's talk. Um, I think um, I think we're going to be it'll be a fun talk. We're here mostly to talk about um, uh, Bill's challenge to the gerrymandering system and Chris Peterson's challenge to the uh, Trump administration. No, <laughs> I got that totally wrong. Um, we're here to talk about default rules in common law contract, um, and I think we probably will. Um, our speaker today, obviously, is Bill Whitford. Everybody here knows Bill. Um, I don't think he requires a significant introduction, but he has been a path-breaking scholar in a number of fields. I think probably you think of yourself mostly as a contract scholar, um, but he has also made truly extraordinary contributions to the law of bankruptcy. He, along with some other folks developed the leading database, that data source that um, everybody in that field uses. Um, I think you were probably one of the inventors of comparative consumer bankruptcy law, um, consumer protection law, um, critical tax theory, um, a number of other fields that um, really, you know, it's, it's pretty extraordinary stuff. Um, so we're very fortunate that Bill is going to be talking uh, about his, his draft paper today that I think all of you should have. Um, we're equally fortunate to have Chris Peterson uh, with us today. Chris is the uh, John, John J. Flynn Endowed uh, Professor at the University of Utah um, Law School. He um, is a nationally recognized expert on consumer protection law um, and I think is one of the most effective voices among legal academics when it comes to actually saying something intelligent about protecting consumers who are often the victims of, you know, pretty shady practices sometimes. I'm not sure if that's exactly what connected you to the um, paper that you published, I think it was last year, on um, the pathway that one might think about if one wanted to raise the question of impeachment of the sitting president, but you, I think, did receive the award for having the most downloads for that paper. Um, on SSRN last year, I think there were about 8,837 downloads um, as of today of his paper on the Trump University sort of legal issues and how that, those might present uh, some questions for those who think that impeachment of the sitting administration, the sitting president rather, might be um, an issue. Um, I don't think of, I don't know that you think of yourself as an expert necessarily on impeachment um, all the time, but it's an interesting paper, it's a compelling read. Um, I think mostly what you're here to talk about today is what you spend most of your time doing, which is consumer protection. He's done it not only as an academic, but as a, a, a senior official at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, I think you were also with the Department of Defense. Um, you've done enormous work um, both in the fields and in, in, in academia um, in thinking about how we can do a better job of protecting consumers. Um, so those are our speakers. Uh, Bill lead off for an hour or so talking about his paper. Chris will then comment on it um, for about 15 minutes. After that, um, I will keep the queue of questions. Um, I've got some in my back pocket, but um, please signal me at any point um, if you wish to uh, ask a question either of Bill or of Chris, um, and um, I will call on you in due course. With that, Bill. Is this working? Yes. And uh, thank you, Jonathan, for that. And I should add that uh, it's not just questions, but comments and diatribes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is obviously a work in progress. Anybody who's looked at the paper knows that, and it's a good time to make comments. Uh, I want to say a few words about John Kidwell. This is the fourth memorial lecture, contracts lecture. Uh, 
to those of you who don't know John, uh, he was a longtime faculty member here, a close collaborator with a number of people, but particularly with Stuart McCauley, who's over here, and me, as we developed our contracts casebook. I did before that the contracts course here at Wisconsin. Uh, and a kind of approach to the study of contracts law that sometimes at least used to be called the Wisconsin approach to contracts, uh, a, a tradition in which I hope this paper falls. John was also a very close personal friend uh, who passed way too early for all kinds of people, but especially for me. I could say many things about John in his work, but what I want to highlight today is his judgment. John had a very Catholic taste for new ideas. Uh, he always could get excited about the latest new thought. But he had a remarkable judgment for which of those new thoughts uh, made sense and kind of had legs. Uh, he was not given to going for the latest fad or going with the flow. In fact, I think he probably took uh, somewhat of a joy in going against the latest fad and against the flow. But for me, uh, he was somebody that I could take my often wild and crazy thoughts and talk to, and somebody who I knew respected me, I knew liked me, could tell me what he thought was exciting, what he thought didn't make sense, what wouldn't have legs. It was really an extremely, what a gift, as I say. I mean, what an extremely useful relationship we had for me. Uh, I miss him intensely. How much I wish he were here to hear this latest iteration of Whitford's crazy thought, <laughs> which he heard many previous editions. Now on to my topic. Uh, let me begin by apologizing for the incompleteness of the paper. It's what I managed to get done by about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but obviously it's ripe for your comments and thoughts, and I will continue working on it. And secondly, I want to explain initially about how I came to write about this topic or want to write about this topic. Uh, there are two sets of literature in the contracts field that are very kind of current. Uh, and they're about the same things, and yet one tradi literature tradition makes no mention of the other. And the question becomes why. The first set of literature is about supply chain contracts and, to a lesser extent, innovation contracts. Maybe I need, should define what I mean by that. Uh, supply chain contracts are contracts basically between manufacturers and their suppliers, the people who supply parts. You could also call them <laughs> distribution contracts, manufacturers, and the wholesalers, jobbers, distributors, retailers who distribute the manufactured product, but most of the literature is about the supply side, Mo recent literature. Stuart McCauley wrote particularly about the distribution side 50 years ago. Uh, the, uh, and innovation contracts are kind of joint efforts uh, by separate and legal entities, separate corporations, to, in a sense, invent something, generally in the pharmaceutical and software fields. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of, but they, their relationship is defined by contract. Uh, so there's a lot of empirical literature about these contracts. Uh, much of it is by non-lawyers who describe how the details of the contract come to fruition, how the parties structure their relationship, how they administer their relationship. But they, the literature doesn't mention contract law pretty much at all, at least the non-lawyer literature. Uh, how it might influence the, deal, the deals. And they don't mostly mention litigation at all either, so not about how it would influence litigation either. Now the second body of literature is a law professor literature. Uh, it's all about contract doctrine. 
and in particular what contract doctrine should be, what the substantive content of it should be. Uh, this literature sometimes goes under the, uh, the rubric contract theory. In fact, I would say the authors themselves describe it as contract theory, so it's not so much a label that's been given to it as a label that they have uh, uh, grabbed. The inquiry is all about how different versions of contract rules, contract law, might impact the behaviors of parties when they're forming a contract. It's based largely on modeling in the modern law and economic tradition and not that much on empirical data. Uh, but it emphasizes the importance of reducing what are sometimes called specification costs, and I'll talk about that. Uh, at formation in the name of efficiency or what is called ex ante efficiency. That's kind of the focus. So the mystery that got me in the paper is why doesn't the first set of literature talk about contract law when the second set is all about how contract law really introduces, impacts the structure or the formation of these deals. Certainly not, not totally, but ha that's the place where contract law has an impact. Now, one of the uh, authors uh, who contributed mightily to the first set of literature is my own son, Josh, who's right here. So I had an easy way to ask that question, and I've asked it several times. I said, Josh, how come you don't talk about law? I mean, he's, you want to hold his book up? He's written one of the first books about the, uh, in this era, set of literature. And he just kind of goes, you know, like Dad, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, but I think what it is, Josh talks to the people who make form these deals, structure them. And he asks them questions about what are you thinking about? And they don't mention law. And that's why he doesn't talk about law. Well, why don't they mention law? So that's my topic. Uh, the, uh, so I'm going to talk about, try to come to some conclusions about what effect doctrine makes in the formation of these supply chain and innovation contracts. And then to go on, as a law professor often does, and say, well, what implications do those findings have for what the doctrine should be? Because that's what law professors are supposed to do, is pronounce what the law should be. Uh, or at least they often do. I, I do so very much as a relationist, or as uh, somebody who comes from the relational contract tradition, which I've been invoked in ever since I first sat at Stuart Macaulay's knees and taught my first contracts course way back in 1965. Uh, I have chosen uh, to focus on contracts laws default rules because that is what contract theorists write so much about, and in particular on remedial rules, remedies, because they are probably the most important of the default rules. Now maybe I should say something initially about what I mean by default rules. Uh, default rules is a term used in contract literature to describe contra legal rules that can be displaced by agreement by the parties. They are the rules that a court will apply to decide the case unless the contract provides otherwise. Um, most remedial rules, what we think of as the law of contract remedies, are in fact default rules, uh, subject for you contracts people in the room to the penalty rules, most importantly. But most of them, uh, and I'll give examples as I go on, are in fact default rules that could be displaced and are frequently are, are displaced by agreement. Uh, now, in my inquiry as to how rules impact behavior, I will define contractual relations into three stages, the formation stage, the performance stage, and then the litigation stage, where I include arbitration in the litigation stage. And I don't think I need to define those terms. They're pretty obvious. Uh, I, the paper begins with a number of methodological issues. I mention only a couple here. Uh, the paper is utopian. Uh, when it comes to addressing what the law should be, tries to be empirical in addressing what difference the law makes, but when it comes to the implications for that about what the law should be, it's utopian in the sense that uh, I will write as if we're writing on a, as most contract theorist scholars do, as if we're writing on a clean slate and we don't have to worry about precedent, which of course is unrealistic. But 
and it ignores all the values of path dependency in law, which are considerable. So I just, I don't worry about that. Uh, that's another book or another paper or something. Uh, the values of precedent and the impact of precedent. And the second uh, method, methodological issue, uh, contract law applies to a very wide range of activities, uh, so broad that meaningful empirical inquiries into the impact of doctrine on the various stages, formation, perform uh, formation performance, and litigation, meaningful generalization, empirical generalizations is just not very practicable. So I have decided to approach it by going into different transaction types. And today I'm only really going to talk about the supply chain and innovation contracts, although I have uh, the last seven pages or so of the draft I handed out deals with another transaction type, and my intent is to go on and describe other transaction types. And I think Chris is going to, comments are going to focus at least in part on a different transaction type. But I think I'll, you'll be too tired of hearing me after I finish the supply chain and innovation contracts. I should sit down. Um, okay, supply chain and innovation contracts. Uh, these are classic long-term contracts with many repeat performances. That is to say the parties, there's many trades that are going on. There are many shipments of parts to the manufacturer. And the relationships are long-term years. Uh, and there's always a, a possibility and indeed a hope of continuing the relationship even uh, uh, you know, there's no expectation that after three years I'm going to move on and get a different supplier. That's not the normal thing. Uh, they also occur within industries with many participants and reliable information flows between the participants, meaning that word gets around about to other industry participants about what happens in one contractual relationship. How perfect that information flow is, it's not perfect. But it's definitely, the information flow is definitely there. Um, my first question is what role default rules play in the formation stage of these contracts? Uh, and uh, the most important question I'm focusing on is whether default rule, because I mean, I'm focusing on default rules, the most important question is to what extent do the parties make efforts, think about default rules, make efforts to displace default rules uh, in, in the formation stage. These efforts are, are of course, not costless. Uh, and they are what the contract theorists mean by specification costs. So I'm asking from an economic point of view, what are the specification costs? at the formation stage uh, that can be traced to the default rules and which you might minimize by manipulating the default rules so they didn't have to do so much thinking about negotiating and drafting uh, at the formation stage. Now I'll begin with a description of <coughs> what might happen in these commercial, in these contractual contexts based on what I call relational contracts theory, which as I say, I've been raised in almost from infancy. Uh, the, uh, the first observation from a relational theory point of view, I'm going to come to the empirical stuff, but uh, let me just give a picture that relational contracts theory might expect to find. The first observation is that litigate, which I think is widely conceded by in all schools, litigation is extremely rare in this con these contractual relationships. Uh, why is it so rare? Well, the relational, from relational contracts theory, there's some obvious reasons. There's an expectation of continued relations, as I have mentioned. And there's certainly a belief amongst the relational contract scholars that there's a social norm out there that you don't sue somebody they expect to do business with the next day. You sue them, you forget the latter. Ain't going to happen. Uh, I'll come back to that proposition, but that's the common assumption. Secondly, there's reputational interest. Word does get around in the industry. Conduct that might prompt litigation or that would 
and that would be frowned on by industry, industry norms, norms of regular behavior in the industry or no, normative uh, ideas in the industry, uh, conduct that violates those will make it difficult to get future business not only from the, the victim, the direct victim, but from others in the industry. <laughs> you, you, in the language of relational contract theory, uh, you're not so trusty, you're not so trustful, you're not, you've destroyed trust. And then, of course, there's always the tremendous cost of litigation these days. That's a big deterrent to litigation as well. A relationist would go so far as to say, from a theoretical point of view at least, that if litigation is perceived as a risk at formation, there simply won't be a deal. One or both parties will just walk away. Uh, so you say, well, if litigation is so rare, why do you have to worry about default rules? I mean, they're directly applicable only when there's litigation. It doesn't happen. So you wouldn't expect a lot of attention spent to default rules uh, at the formation stage. Moreover, and this is still in the relational contract theory point, uh, if for some reason default terms prove problematic to the parties, for example, some issue comes up not in litigation, which almost never happens, but nonetheless in the performance of the contract where default rules begin to influence uh, default rules, which are about what would happen if there were litigation, begin to influence the parties in the course of performing the contract. If that comes up, it's a second proposition of relational contract theory that these contracts can always be adjusted and modified, and are. Uh, it's a fundamental belief of relational contract theory that the agreement process is a continual one. Uh, and even if there's a ceremony occasion like a closing, uh, which seems to symbolize the formation or beginning of a contract, in practice, much of the agreement was made before closing, and there'll be further adjustments afterwards. Uh, the agreement process is a continuous, long-term one. It's not something that happens in a magic moment of time. Uh, or, as I like to say, the number one expectation in a relational contract is that it will be changed in some significant way before the parties stop doing business, probably in several significant ways. Number one expectation. Uh, so now, that's the relational contract's vision. Now, what does the empirical evidence show? I'm going to begin. Uh, with Claire Hill's work on errors or mistakes in written contracts, uh, which some of my uh, favorite scholarship in the 21st century. Uh, Claire's work is uh, not exclusively or even mostly about supply chain contracts, but it's certainly about kind of long-term contracts, multiple pages, negotiated by lawyers with great deal of care. Well, maybe not so much care, that's, I guess, the point. <laughs> but long-term contract, I mean, it could be long-term, but long contracts, many pages, many words. And uh, what she emphasizes is, uh, uh, in, and they're between two large businesses, you know, where resources to pay lawyers, uh, I mean, they're interested in saving money, but the resources are there. Uh, what she emphasizes is that these contracts contain many errors, many avoidable errors. Uh, and uh, they just go on. I mean, nobody seems to care much. Uh, now, one example she gives, which I'll give here, she gives many. But one I'll give here because it's easy to understand. You imagine, let's say, a 10-page contract. Most of it, of course, is copy and pasted from other contracts in related transactions that are stored on some computer. Uh, and uh, there are probably a couple, three different associates working on that contract. And the one associate's job is to get into the contract uh, some, uh, some rule, I'll call it A, rule A, that the parties have negotiated and they want to be sure it's in the contract. So on page two, associate one inserts a new clause six, which says, notwithstanding anything else in the contract, rule A. And some other associates working and supposed to get in rule B. And so on page 7, they say in clause 23, notwithstanding anything else in the contract, 
rule B. Well, it turns out there are certain first factual circumstances where rule A and rule B point in exactly opposite directions. And anybody who proofread the contract could figure that out, but nobody does. And the contract gets signed, there's a closing, performance goes on, maybe those circumstances never happen. If they do happen, they get together and say, oops, and they just work it out. It, it, there's still no litigation. She writes about this kind of stuff. I hope I characterize it fair enough, Claire. Uh, there, it's a very rich warring literature. Hmm? Them, the warring notwithstanding. the warring notwithstanding clauses. This is kind of the, perhaps the easiest of the of the errors to explain. Uh, the um, so the specification costs of better proofreading are not that great given the size of these deals. Uh, so it requires some explanation about why it doesn't happen. Uh, and the relational theory provides a possible answer. You know, it just doesn't matter very much. Mostly, the error won't matter, and when it does, you just work it out. Adjustments and modifications are the norm. Uh, Claire goes even further, uh, more provocatively, uh, to suggest that at least in cases, if one party gets, you know, a Type A personality gets up tight and says, "I want to proofread this," and I want to get correct all the errors, it makes the other party think, what's going on here? Do they think we're going to litigate in this contract? Maybe I shouldn't enter this deal. So it can be counterproductive to say you want to clean up the errors. Whereas um, she likes to say, said, well, she, I don't know if she likes to say it, but said at one point, ensuring that there are errors in your drafting is a bonding mechanism. It's a way of declaring that you really have trust. It makes the deal more likely. Uh, so a real Machiavellian person would put in a couple errors, you know, uh, into the contract to make sure everything works better. She didn't say that, but anyhow, <laughs> that would be an implication. So that's one body of empirical knowledge, you know, just the implications of the fact that there are a lot of errors in there. And she didn't write mostly about supply chain contracts, but it's got to be true of supply chain contracts and innovation contracts as well. Now we get directly to the empirical studies of supply chain contracts, and uh, I want to call out here. Uh, a work that I know Julia Krzysztofski is uh, engaged in at the moment. Uh, I've seen a tentative first draft uh, where she's making the point that, you know, a lot of supply chain relationships, there's not what I'll call a systematic written contract. Uh, it's, uh, the parties have a long-term relationship. What I describe about uh, the relationship in terms of relational contract theory is probably mostly true. There's just not an overall systematic contract to describe what the parties think about. They use what forms, maybe, written forms that we used to call, maybe we still do call purchase orders and acknowledgement of order forms. Uh, these are, they pull them out of the file drawer, they put in a few terms, you know, because you don't, you have to order, you have to say what quantity you want, what date you want, uh, what the item is probably what the catalog number is, or that's my old fashionedness, but whatever the modern version of a catalog number is. Uh, the, uh, and you send it on, it's got a lot of other terms. And then the seller sends back, the buyer does, and the seller sends back another form. And this is a ch common topic in contracts courses or Article II courses, sales courses. Uh, we call it the battle of the forms. And of course the problem is that the forms have inconsistent terms with each other. One's drafted very pro-buyer and one's drafted very pro-seller and they conflict. Of course, usually if there's a problem, they work it out, there's no litigation. Uh, it's amazing that this battle of the forms problem has been in the contracts case books for years and years and years. The inadequacy of the Article Two of the UCC's solution to the problem has been well known since uh, uh, Alan Peters wrote her classic article in the 50s. Uh, and maybe before that, and there's no solution, no legal solution, because it doesn't matter very much. They work it out. Uh, well, I suggest that as a hypothesis. Anyhow, there is that range of transactions. Litigation remains rare. Uh, default rules don't have much impact. Uh, they may impact a little bit about how these form, what these forms say, the purchase order and the acknowledgement, but these forms are used repetitively, repetitively. Uh, the specification costs have to be 
relatively minor, I mean, per contract at least, because the purchase order form and the acknowledgement form is used repeatedly. So the per contract cost of whatever lawyer thing goes in has got to be fairly minor. Now, sometimes there are systematic written contracts governing the overall relationships and providing specific terms for subsequent transactions. And this is where the recent literature has been, where there are systematic written contracts, uh, where Josh's work, Lisa Bernstein's work, who gave the second Kidwell uh, lecture, has written an important piece about these kinds of contracts. Uh, some of these articles contain, this is a bit of a side, contain a couple implications about law that I want to counter initially. Uh, and this is not Josh, the non-lawyer's uh, work, but the lawyer's work. <laughs> uh, one is that until there is a writing, a systematic writing, there's no liability. It's, we're in the informal world. Everything gets worked out. There are no legal rights, but they get it worked out. But once there is a writing, it is said the relationship is formalized, the word you, is used in the literature. And the writing invokes availability of legal sanctions for breach, protection of the expectation interest, which is very important to the parties, it's said. And the reason for the writing, or a primary reason for the party. And most importantly, informality ends. From now on, it's by the book, that is to say, by the contract. Well, I object to both implications. In the first place, before the writing, there's still lots of liability, uh, even though the closing hasn't happened. The statute of frauds has a lot of uh, has a lot of applicability here, but it also has a lot of exceptions. And pre-contractual liability is now pretty well established. Anybody familiar with the case Pen Texaco versus Pennzoil? I mean, that was a pre-closing case. Uh, a lot of liability. It was at the time the largest civil just judgment in history, seven and a half billion dollars. We could tell stories about how it was paid, which was interesting, but I'm not going to go there. Um, secondly, and more fundamentally, uh, the existence of a writing, a closing, it does not mean the end of informality, nor to modifications and adjustments. They continue to happen. Uh, and uh, I also question whether there's any reliance on legal enforceability, that that's a reason for having a systematic writing, uh, although I can't exactly prove it uh, empirically. But I doubt the parties care much about legal enforceability. Certainly I know that litigation remains extremely rare. Uh, well, that then, do I think, is the main reason for having systematic written contracts. Uh, I'd like to go back to the most f fundamental proposition of relational contracts theory. Uh, the most important task of the formation stage is planning. The parties must communicate with each other what their mutual visions are for the future, figure out where they're inconsistent, work out the inconsistencies. Uh, Ian McNeil, the co-founder of relational contract theory, along with Stuart McCauley, wrote, I can assure you, more pages about the importance of planning than you'll ever want to read, but there's a lot of them. <laughs> uh, and they're persuasive. Uh, writing things down, as we all know from our own academic work, it is a tremendous disciplining process. The process of writing exposes where the misunderstandings are. It exposes where the gaps are in your logic, the leaps. Uh, that's as true for parties planning a supply chain relationship or an innovation contract is for me when I'm trying to write an article about the influence of default rules. Now, these, so the, putting it in writing is fairly easy to guess at why it's important. Uh, now, why does that writing take the form of a contract? That I don't know so much about. I mean, I, that's an interesting question. I mean, why did it take a form of an exchange of memorandums? Why do we have this ceremony called the closing? That certainly laws it, suggests evidence that they care about legal enforceability. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, 
uh, maybe it's just custom. I mean, path dependency is a tremendous force in human affairs. Maybe it's just the way you do things when you could do it in some other way. I don't know about that. Uh, but let me return to my main topic. Is there any ability to reduce specification costs in the preparation of these written systematic contracts by manipulating default rules? I have argued that uh, in relational theory one would presume not because litigation is extremely rare uh, and if default terms uh, present problems you just work it out. Uh, but in fact, there's not as complete freedom to make modifications in these systematic written contract situations as a relational theory, the simple, I, simple version of it I presented presupposes. And there's at least two important reasons. First of all, most of these supply chain contracts, these <coughs> systematic written supply chain contracts, are standard form contracts called master service agreements in the literature. There are standard form contracts drafted by the manufacturer. Uh, they're drafted by the manufacturer, maybe partly because they have superior bargaining power in a circumstance, but most importantly because the manufacturer <coughs> enters into many of them, whereas the suppliers enter into few. It's a generalization applicable to standard form contracts in, in general that the party who enters into the many, many times will do the dra bear the drafting costs because it can be spread over many different transactions. Uh, uh, the, um, the, the standard form contracts serve a dual function. They are whatever the function is in having a systematic, systematic written contract, whether it's to invoke legal formality, uh, in any event, the writing process is, isn't and useful, as I pointed out, in just helping you plan. Uh, but the other function it serves, in addition to planning and maybe making the agreement legally enforceable, is a kind of instruction manual for staff. These organizations are very large organizations. And they have to coordinate the activities, not of the people who make the deal, but all kinds of other people down the hierarchy generally. And the contract becomes like, uh, or a simplified version of it that gets written later, becomes like an instruction manual for that staff about how you conduct relations if you're the manufacturer's staff with suppliers, or if you're the supplier's staff, with the manufacturer. Um, now these two points about these master service agreements explain why modifications, though they happen, are much less frequent. Uh, buyers are under pressure to treat all suppliers alike. <coughs> uh, if they extend a favorable modification to one supplier, there's bound to be pressure to extend the same terms to another. Anybody who has more than one kid knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, so the fact that if you make a modification for one, you probably have to make it for others, uh, makes it more expensive, of course, to have a modification because it covers many transactions or many relationships. Uh, and the second point is uh, that these contracts perform this instruction manual function. And just for organizing a large administ administrative structure, a business, uh, and you instruct the lower staff the, in how to do it, and then you make a modification, you have to re-instruct them, and so forth. It just that adds to the reasons why you don't like to change it once you got it set. I mean, modifications happen, uh, but there's more reasons for them not to happen once you get into these standard form contract kinds of situations. A second reason that modifications are less frequent is because MSAs, uh, master service agreements, typically contain, and other contracts too, typically contain written modification only clauses. Uh, now, Written modification only clauses, contracts teachers know what they are. They're, they're, they are partly planning for performance clauses. They instruct the staff the process that you go through in order to have a modification. You've got to have a procedure. Uh, particularly where uh, the contract is serving this function as an instruction manual for staff. 
um, they also often require written modification clauses. Uh, they often require that the agreement on one side or the other, we'll say the manufacturer side, has to be by an officer of a certain higher level. Uh, and there can be lots of reasons for that, but it is certainly uh, uh, the case that uh, lower members of staff may not even see the, all the interests that the organization has in any proposed modification, and lower members of staff may have perverse incentives. They don't have the organization's best interest, they have their particular best interest where they may get a bonus if they have more production or something like that. Uh, and a modification would help them achieve the, uh, whatever level they have to get to get the bonus. So that, those can be functions of uh, written modification only clauses. Uh, but they also make it, of course, more expensive to have a modification because you have to go through the procedures and wait in line to get approval of some higher monkey muck. So as contract teachers know, because the cases, case books are full of them, they're also honored in the breach very frequently. That is to say, the lower levels of staff just go off and make their oral modifications anyhow with lower members of staff of some supplier. Uh, and usually it works out, and they may even conspire not to let the upper ops know about this uh, change. Uh, and uh, you know, we get lots of contracts cases where this has happened, and things have gone on, and then some higher up pulls the cords, whoops, you didn't have a written modification, and then you have a lawsuit because the contract said no modification unless in writing, and the counter argument is, yeah, but that clause was waived by your, uh, your associate's uh, behavior, and it's, uh, you talk about a war of clauses, this is a war of doctrines, as it were, and uh, the cases go both ways. Sometimes a written modification only clause wins. Sometimes the argument for waiver wins. Uh, in our own case book, the Chestnut case that I always like <coughs> on this issue is Nana, Nana Cooley versus Shell, exactly what happened. Uh, and uh, so I don't know what to make of all that, but I mean written modification only clauses are there, but they're honored in the breach often. Uh, well, because of the ability to modify contracts is limited with respect to these MSAs uh, and innovation contracts, uh, we would expect to see, uh, I would expect to see terms dealing with default terms that are undesirable because you can't necessarily change them in the end uh, when the problems arise. It's more hard, it's more difficult. Uh, and there are some terms, and I'll talk about them. Now, because they're standard form contracts, <coughs> you might wonder initially whether it's worth worrying about attempting to manipulate default terms in order to save the drafters money in changing uh, default rules in these standard form contracts because they're standard form contracts. So. Whatever the cost in changing them, the per contract cost has got to be much less. Uh, but leave that aside. Uh, uh, I sort of suspect that I, I should also say that however you draft the default rules, uh, there's bound to be some uncertainty about how they'll be applied. And if you're writing a standard form contract, wouldn't you, since the per contract cost, specification cost is relatively small, wouldn't you draft to just provide more certainty for what you want? It would be very hard to sell to convince the bosses to save a little bit of money and just rely on the default rule when you have the power to maybe produce more certainty by drafting. So I don't even know that manipulating default rules has much capacity here to change uh, specification costs, but uh, nonetheless, what are some of the kinds of rules you see? Well. Most common probably are clauses limiting a buyer's recovery of consequential damages upon a seller's breach. Uh, contract seizures all know about these clauses. Uh, they're ubiquitous. Uh, they're kind of form clauses. The, the, they're available on the internet, on form books everywhere. Examples of clauses that you can use that have been validated by courts. It's just a cut and paste job or something like that. 
the specification costs have to be minimum. The exception, and I didn't cover this exception in the paper, but it's an important one, and it will be covered in the next draft. Uh, there are clauses dealing with so-called epidemic breaches. And an epidemic breach, I use a term of art, but uh, an epidemic breach is where there's some problem in the design or quality of the production by a supplier that gets incorporated in the manufacturer's product leading to a, a recall of the product or, God forbid, products liability litigation down the road against the manufacturer. And these contracts will often have a negotiated clause about epidemic breaches, uh, often requiring the supplier to take out insurance to cover the manufacturer's liability in the event of this kind of breach, breach of warranty, if you want to call it. Uh, and uh, I doubt that default rules can reduce that. There's a lot of money at stake when the manufacturer has to recall or possibly products liability, it's hard to imagine the manufacturer relying on a default rule rather than try to negotiate exactly what they want. But nonetheless, there are clauses like that. And they are adjusting default rules. They are no doubt adjusting default rules. Now, the other category that I'm going to talk about uh, are called termination clauses. Uh, they've been particularly uh, talked recently by uh, a young scholar at BYU named Matthew Jennington, uh, the, uh, particularly in innovation contracts. Uh, a termination clause limits the buyer's liability upon breach to something less than expectations, where the buyer is the terminator. But it also, but it also uh, limits uh, the seller's damages where it's the seller who's the breacher, uh, the terminator. I guess I shouldn't call him a breacher. Uh, and uh, they clearly alter default rules, and default rules primarily with respect to remedies. Uh, because you, know, you should recognize they're called termination clauses like, as though they, they authorize termination. But you don't need a clause to authorize termination. I mean, specific performance is a rare event. Maybe not as rare as, well, rarer than litigation, I guess, by definition. But uh, specific performance almost never happens. So you can terminate uh, a contract. You might have to pay damages, but you can terminate. You don't need a clause to terminate. What these are clauses are doing are limiting the damages if you do terminate sometimes to nothing, more often to what contracts teachers call restitution or some version of reliance, and excluding expectation damages. But the clauses, as Matt points out, do more than that. Uh, these are dealing with innovation contracts, and this is maybe accounts for their presence as much as anything. In these innovation contracts, which are trying to produce inventions, there's the product of what happens to the joint product they produce before termination, and particularly to the intellectual property rights to, those, to that. Maybe developing work. Maybe there's been no patent yet. Uh, but anyhow, they often provide uh, detailed provisions about what happens to those intellectual property rights <coughs> upon termination. Well, these termination clause clearly negotiated. Uh, they are specification costs, uh, but they're costs that I doubt can be reduced by manipulating the substantive content of default rules. Uh, we're never going to have a change in the default rules that eliminate the ability to collect expectation damages as a matter of contract default uh, for all kinds of reasons, but importantly because of the importance that contract damages can play in deterring opportunistic behavior, which is something I'm going to talk about next. Uh, and because the, their, important provisions, uh, their important provisions dealing with the disposition of IP rights almost ensures there will be a termination clause in these contracts, and how much more expensive can it be to add a few terms about limiting damages for termination might specify how much effort 
uh, the seller must make before seeking to recover uh, reliance damages for work in progress, uh, just as a kind of provision that might be in there, altering default rules or specifying default rules. But I just wonder if there's going to be a clause anyhow, how much more expensive it can be. Bottom line, in this area uh, of supply side contracts and supply chain contracts, innovation contracts, I simply find it hard to find direct evidence that it's possible to reduce specification costs in a meaningful way by manipulating default rules. I just don't see the evidence. And that is my, the heavy lift of this paper. Uh, but now, uh, I know I've talked a long time, I want to just cover a few other points and, and I'll turn it over to Chris. Uh, I, I want to first talk about opportunism and contract efforts to limit opportunism. There's a whole other body of literature about contract design that is all about how parties <laughs> try to limit uh, opportunism in contracts. What is opportunism? Well, opportunism is something that happens when there's a disparity in bargaining power. Now, if the disparity in bargaining power exists before the contract is made, before formation, we don't call it opportunism. We call it capitalism. You know, the, the, the more powerful gets a better deal. But if the disparity in bargaining power comes into existence after the contract is made, and it is used by the more powerful party to try to strike a better deal through a modification, that's what we call opportunism. Uh, and it's widely frowned on. <laughs> it's considered a bad thing. Uh, now, how can contracts kind of anticipate the possibility of opportunism and fight against it. Uh, the, uh, some possibility put, for example, written modification only clauses that ensure if somebody's trying to drive, change the deal in a way that's adverse to one party, that at least the higher ups in the corporation get to see the proposal and sign off on it because they'll better understand all the financial implications, or hopefully. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there isn't opportunistic modifications. There are. I mean, when somebody gets that superior bargaining power and tries to exploit it through a modification, the normal response is to cave. <laughs> because litigation's rare, because you want to do business in the future. You know, litigation is not a good solution. Although we hope that the threat that the party will refuse the, to the, agree to the modification, and it might result in litigation. But that threat, if the remedies in litigation are strong enough, might at least deter how hard a bargain the party in superior bargaining power tries to drive. Still, in the contract design literature, it becomes clear that the major effort to fight opportunism is not through uh, the default rules or remedies the major effort is to try to prevent this shift in the balance of power occurring post-formation. That's what I call a prevention strategy. And there are many strategies, much written about and long held, for doing that. I mean, a common one is to sequence performances so that neither party to the contract has made what is called in the literature asymmetric investments. If one party's made more investment in the relationship than the other, that creates a superior bargaining power because the party with less investment can just walk away and cause big losses for the other party. And uh, so you just sequence the performances so you don't ever get this situation where there's asymmetric investments. Or you have great transparency. This is done in the, Brady, in the innovation contracts and written famously by Bob Scott and Gilson and Sable in their braiding article, and to some extent by Jillian Hadfield, uh, another contributor to this literature. Uh, you have lots of transparency about what each, everybody's doing. Josh writes about this too, but not uh, so much in terms of, well, Josh writes about this too. Uh, and, and the purpose is really to have early note warnings about somebody shirking. If one party is not making these, the, the, the 
the in, in, investments in the relationship they're supposed to. It's an early warning to the other side so they can stop making their investments and keeping the investments from getting too out of balance, creating the imbalance of bargaining power. And, and a very old-fashioned way to do it is bonding, uh, which goes back to the Middle Ages. But uh, if you still used in real estate construction contracts, and I'm sure others, every day. I mean, the party who's going to fears being in a situation where they could be subject to opportunistic holdups just requires the other party to post a bond so that the, they can just say, well, go ahead and breach. I'll sue you and I'll collect because here's this bond. It's, it's going to be an easier lawsuit. So there's other, the, these preventative strategies are the way to deal with opportunism. Now, I want to talk about the performance stage. Uh, two relational scholars, uh, David Campbell and Robert Scott, have independently suggested that vague default rules that allow for the possibility of uh, generous damage recoveries, um, vague default rules that allow for generous damage recoveries can incentivize uh, unproductive behavior during performance. This behavior called strategic behavior by Scott consists of behavior to induce the breach by another party or behavior that will uh, increase the damages recoverable by the party engaging in the strategic behavior uh, in hopes that uh, in an effort to induce breach uh, because they think that they can, they'll benefit more from Dan at this point not, not when they made the deal, of course, but at this point they think they're going to benefit more from recovering damages than they are from continued performance of the contract. But, of course, you can only recover damage if you induce the other party to do the breach. Uh, Scott calls this kind of a strategic behavior as crowding out the normal informal adjustments. Crowding out is his term. That are the bread and butter of the normal relationship. <coughs> In the paper at page 28, I give a couple of factual examples to try to particularize this high, uh, rather abstract concept. Uh, for the contracts people, a kind of vague default rules that might cre create this uh, uh, kind of incentives are the lost volume seller rule for the seller, which can lead to some very large recoveries if the seller can fit under it. Uh, and the consequential damages for the buyer limited by very weak restraints under Hadley and Baxendale, the mitigation rule, burden of proof, which are the default rule limitations on consequential damages. But if they're, those doctrines are weak restraints on recovery, cut buyers, consequential damages, then that can lead to some very large recoveries. Uh, now, the direct empirical evidence of the existence of this kind of strategic behavior is modest, to say the least. Uh, when in the relational contract, one can doubt there is much such behavior because the induced breach will have the same function of destroying the possibility of future relationships that relational contracts people hypothesize. Uh, and litigation is very expensive. So boy, you better get an awful big recovery in that damages lawsuit to, to make it more profitable than continued performance. Uh, nonetheless, you can't deny the possibility that vague uh, damages rules could incentivize this kind of strategic behavior, at least it's possible. Uh, and that would argue for uh, caution in allowing default rules that allow for these very large damage recoveries, uh, which is the kind of the way Scott uses it. The difficulty with that argument is that large damages recoveries are one of the things that protects somebody subject to an opportunistic holdup. You know, when that happens, you hope it doesn't happen. When it happens, one of the things you can do besides just caving is to say, well, go ahead and do whatever you're threatening. I'll just sue you and get a lot of damages. And that becomes a more effective deterrent to opportunistic behavior the larger the damages are. So some kind of balance, and exactly where the balance should be uh, is not clear. Uh, maybe because it's unclear, 
it's hard to say that these problems in the performance stage should influence how we draft default rules, because we don't really know uh, what their implications are. And then we get to the litigation stage, and I've talked too long, but uh, uh, here default rules clearly make a difference. I mean, they make a difference when cases are decided, and for these purposes, I leave aside the whole legal realist continue, critical legal studies dispute about whether rules decide cases or the judge's politics or what the judge ate for breakfast or all that stuff. I'm just going to assume rules make a difference in how the judge decides a case. It also leaves aside juries, which I've written about before. Juries can clearly be law lawless. The whole issue of how much default rules control decision, de jury decision making is a vastly uh, understudied problem. Uh, but let's go to settlements, because settlements are by far more important than trials. We get a litigation stage, and the important thing is settlement, the vanishing trials hypothesis. Litigation is extremely rare. Trial is whatever is more limited than extremely rare. My vocabulary leaves me. But uh, the, uh, in, in settlements, there's worked out theory, and I, I, I talk about it in the paper, but I've talked so long. But the gist of it, so I'm going to not talk about it now unless somebody brings it up in questions, but the gist of it is this, and it's, here we get into the rule standards debate where the contract theories talk about, that uh, I introduce a couple of goals that one might, might want to pursue through your manipulation of all rules. In, 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 in the litigation stage. So what are you trying to achieve when you try to manipulate default rules? Here, default rules make a difference. Well, one I call ex post efficiency, which is just reducing the costs of litigation. Uh, and the theory is, and it's a lot of literature on it, that if the Default rules are that we call it's called rules as opposed to standards. If the default rules lead to more or less predictable results as a result, if the case were to go to trial, that will encourage settlement because the party's guesses as to where trial will be will be within a finite range because the default rules don't allow for a lot of variance in those estimates. And since it costs money to go to trial, both parties might agree that there are places in that range where they're both better off by mutually saving the litigation costs, the procedural costs. Uh, and as the rules become vaguer, to what are called standards in the literature, the chance that there'll be a place where both parties will agree, a point, well, they're better off at that point because of the save litigation costs. Uh, then taking their chances at trial become less. So if you want to encourage settlements, have predictable rules. Uh, that's the argument. Now there's certainly some counter arguments that I talk about in the paper, uh, but it points towards getting rid of the vaguer default rules, like we're putting strict burden of proof on them so that they don't affect predicted outcomes of trials, like for example, the seller's lost profit, volume profit, seller lost volume profits for a seller, uh, or the buyer's consequential damages, the lost volume seller rule for the seller, as I meant to say. But the other one is what we call freedom of contract, or I like to call autonomy. Some pump people might call it fairness, the other goal. Uh, this is, of course, a classic goal of contract law, and it goes back very philosophically to the idea that in our society, uh, people who have property should have some freedom to dispose of it as they choose. And on the terms they choose, you can justify that as a matter of personal autonomy. You can justify it as a matter of uh, economic efficiency. Ultimately, it produces a better economy. Uh, both justifications have some validity. Uh, and that points one towards addressing, uh, using the default rules to try to parrot uh, what the parties implicitly or explicitly assumed at formation, because that's protecting their party, their ability. To, that's when they got into this contractual relationship, protecting their ability to dispose of their property to see fit. 
And the more accurate way to try to guess what their explicit or implicit uh, assumptions were is to have a kind of contextualized inquiry. At least I postulate that. But of course, as we know, the contract scholars know from all the literature about the interpretation debates, text versus context, that's another body of literature I haven't dealt with. Uh, um, but, it, but as we know, a contextualized inquiry yields a greater variance in predicted outcome than uh, a textual or a restricted inquiry into the assumptions. It, the restricted inquiry will be less accurate, but, uh, but it will lead to a more predictable trial result. So you get kind of a conflict here in the debate about where the default rules should be uh, if you're just focusing on trying to pro the, 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 the settlement stage uh, part of litigation. Because uh, autonomy and fairness would suggest to contextualize inquiry broader, broader default rules and let the contextualized inquiry figure out when you're going to have a very broad consequential damages recovery potential and when you're not. But the ex post efficiency one would suggest trying to restrict that. Well, conclusion and Chris. Uh, the, uh, I suggest that in formulating default rules, the focus should be on uh, should be primarily on the impact of default rules at the litigation stage. Those who advocate focusing on the impact of default rules in the formation stage seem to me have a considerable burden of proof. There isn't much evidence of impact. Uh, I can't deny there's no impact. And of course, they always make the argument, it's a valid argument, that it, to the extent it has impact in the formation stage, it affects all the contracts. Only a very few of them will enter the litigation stage. Uh, so if there's any impact at the formation stage, it's probably more important than the impact at the litigation stage. Uh, that's the argument for paying a great deal of attention to specification costs. But I just don't see the evidence that there is avoidable specification costs by manipulating default rules. It seems to me the burden should be on the show that it's possible. Now, with this change in focus, the basic issues may well be the same. Should the rules be what we call the rules standards debate? Should the rules be biased towards rules that are, lead to predictable trial results? Or should the rules be more open that allow more, in a sense, discretion for the judge in deciding the case, and but leading to greater vagueness? The, the debate may still be the same. But the arguments in favor of the rule as opposed to the standard are different. It has to do with the impact on ex post efficiency and stuff like that. And consequently, the conclusion you might reach will be different. Uh, another conclusion I come to is that the stakes, when one's drafting default rules, are simply much less than is commonly assumed. Uh, to put it another way, it may not va matter very much what the default rules say, as long as they can be displaced. <laughs> as, of course, that's the definition. It may not really mean very much what they say. Uh, it does give law professors a lot of ways to get tenure, and many have. <laughs> so that's a very important externality. But uh, beyond that, uh, and to conclude where I began, it helps resolve the mystery that got me on this odyssey. These non-lawyers who write about these contracts, they don't talk about law, because actually law didn't matter very much. <laughs> now I wrote about the next contract as well in the paper, the next type of contract, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to monopolize the discussion here longer, so you can ask me questions about it if you'd like. Thank you very much. I look forward to your comments. Great, Bill. Thank you very much. Um, I have started to keep a queue. Um, if folks have questions or comments, just signal, and I'll add you to the queue. But before doing so, Chris is going to give us some of his thoughts um, on what we start. Chris. Well, um, for, for first off, um, I just want to say thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, if it's okay, I think I'd prefer to just sit and uh, 
because I don't have that much to say and it just seems easier to sort of fold naturally into the, the questions and comments from, from the audience. Um, but uh, I, I, by way of thank you, I just want to say what, to me, what a tremendous honor it is to me to get to sit at the, at the table with um, uh, Professor Whitford, um, in part because I admire his work it, um, for its tremendous intellectual courage Bill's one of these great scholars who uh, does a lot of different stuff and has, has contributed to very different literatures over the course of decades. Uh, uh, he, uh, and I've always aspired to that, but I, I to be honest, um, only seem to be able to finish papers when I'm angry. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I'm just I, maybe too lazy. I don't know, or, or I just end up getting drawn back into the papers where I'm mad. That just sort of pulls me in. It, it, it means that it gives off a an impression that I'm always mad about things. I'm really not. I'm actually not a mad guy. It's just that I can only write about things that I'm mad about. Um, well, uh, and, and I guess. Um, uh, I also want to dis give the disclosure that I know that there are a lot of serious uh, contract theory scholars in the room, and I feel um, very inadequate to the task of talking about a contract theory paper because that has not been my life's work so far. My focus has been almost, as, as Jonathan said, almost exclusively on um, consumer uh, transactions and, and, and pretty uh, practical and applied ways most of the time. Um, because I can only write about things I'm angry about, I almost always only write about people who have been ripped off by bullies. Um, and, and so, because the, 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 that seems to be what makes me mad. Um, the, but that being said, I do think maybe to the extent that I have some con contribution to give to this, to this paper, um, I think that it's maybe to sort of think about the outer boundaries of where um, Professor Whitford's theory m may go in into other sort of areas of contract contracts that are not what he's talking about. Um, because I don't know that I have anything to add or any great insights about um, uh, uh, supply chain contracts. Uh, uh, the, the second part of the paper, which he, he did not talk about, is something I'm, is a little more comfortable territory for me. It's the, he, the second part of the paper are uh, government debt and corporate bonds, uh, which is getting closer to the thing that I know a lot about. Um, but I do, I do think that um, uh, so the two sort of pieces of his paper are um, you know, predominantly purchase of goods contracts uh, in supply chain contracts governed by Article 2 of the Uniform Commercial Code. And then uh, 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 credit contracts in the second part of the paper, which he talked a little bit less about, which would be governed by Article Three of the Uniform Commercial Code if it's structured as an, uh, an instrument, as a, as a, um, a, a note, uh, but, but also Article Nine of the Uniform Commercial Code if there are you know, pledged collateral involved. Well, so I thought, well, okay, all right, I'm gonna take a talk about two examples and limit myself to that in the, in the consumer context and see whether or not some of the examples that Bill is holding up hold true in, in, in a consumer context and, tell, and think about whether or not that adds to the theory or detracts from it or whether or not it might need, need some modifications in, in other broader contexts. That's, I think, an important uh, part of any contract theory because unlike uh, property law, I think to a degree of tort law, certainly constitutional law, there is tremendous breadth to the theory that has to sort of, um, it's part of why I think the professors tease at it so much. Contract theory has to govern so many different types of transactions. So uh, I'm gonna pick two as foils for his, his, um, his paper. With respect to the Article 2 point P portion of his paper, um, I, how about this example as, a, as an interesting foil? Um, food services contracts at restaurants, something that we all know something about, but are very much governed by Article 2 just in the same way that um, uh, 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 supply chain uh, contracts are. You know, a, a, a hamburger uh, is just as much a, a good under Article 2 because it's a, a thing that's movable at the time it identifies to a contract as a, a, a heavy piece of machinery or some steel or some component that's gonna go into a, a, manu a car, um, you know, auto manufacturing um, facility. So they're both governed by Article 2. Um, it strikes me, though, that unlike supply chain contracts, there is tremendous use of default terms. Default terms tend to pervade food services, retail food services contracts. Um, why do I say that? Well, 
um, uh, uh, because there's no form, there's no, there, there are not, uh, there's not occasion to have standard form terms and, uh, that would allow the, the sort of, I guess, arguably more powerful, more repeat player to default out or to sort of change out of the default terms. So just some examples, every time you go and buy some uh, food for your lunch, uh, that food comes uh, uh, with the full faith of an implied warranty of title, suggesting that the food that you're purchasing from the supplier actually owns that food, and it's not encumbered some, by some previous lien that might contaminate the food. Um, it's also uh, uh, subject to an implied warranty of merchantability that the food is fit for its ordinary use. Uh, if the food includes some sort of, um, uh, um, you know, uh, if it's tainted in some way, it's poisonous, um, well, that's actually a relatively frequent, if it, to the extent that it happens, a source of litigation. In, in those kinds of cases, um, it is probably Article II's default implied warranty of merchantability and its consequential damages provision, uh, which the code clearly says is n not disclaimable even if they wanted to in the case of, um, it's unconscionable to disclaim it in the case of uh, uh, personal injury damages. Um, uh, and then also there's an implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose that I think would be reasonably uh, assumed to exist in many instances at, at restaurants. For example, if you say, I have a peanut allergy, uh, please don't bring me anything that has any peanuts in it, and then the server brings you something with a peanut in it, well, that's not fit for the particular purpose. The server had reason to know of the special use that you were going to put the goods to, uh, and I think there's very likely a potential liability there. Um, and again, I, I, this is not by way to say that, that um, Professor Whitford is incorrect about, uh, about supply chain contracts. It, it seems to me he's being quite sensible about that, but it does provide an interesting contrast, doesn't it? So the natural thing to say was, well, okay, well, maybe in consumer contracts it's completely different. But I think that there's a second example that goes along with the second part of his paper, which he talked less about, that does, I think, ratify a lot of what Bill had to say. And for that, I'd like to pivot to not uh, corporate debt, but consumer debt, uh, which is a, a, a huge and important part of our national economy. Um, our, some of our largest debt markets are consumer markets. The mortgage market, I think we all remember about a decade ago, very nearly shattered our economy. Uh, and there's troubling signs of, of, of you know, similar patterns that are emerging in both the student lending market and also the securitized uh, purchase money auto finance market. But I want to talk in particular about one relatively small component of the market, but one that troubles me a lot. And I think perhaps it's because um, on Tuesday, I testified as an expert in a, uh, an arbitral trial on what's called a car title loan. Uh, for those of you that don't know what that means, it's a form of a payday loan. Uh, and the average interest rate on car title loans would be about 300% APR. Um, that's nationwide. The car title loans are, are common in about 30 to 35 states in the United States. They were illegal for the vast majority of American history, but now are quite common. This particular case, this arbitration, involved a, uh, it was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. The borrower was uh, a Native American woman, Navajo, uh, and she uh, pledged her pickup truck, which had a worth of about $2,300. She got a $1,900 loan in exchange for the security interest, the non-possessory security interest. Uh, the lender took uh, uh, her clear title, took physical possession of the certificate of title. Uh, the 300% interest rate was applied to the loan. Uh, she had tremendous difficulty retiring the debt that would appreciate so quickly. Why? Because she made $11 an hour. Um, imagine trying to consolidate enough money to retire a, a, a $1,900 loan $11 an hour at a time. Very difficult to do. And what ended up happening was she paid $5,623 on the $1,900 loan over the course of you know, about a year and a half where she's trying to get payments in constantly, can't quite get them there on time, one after another. And, uh, uh, and guess how much money uh, of the $5,600 was applied to principal? $1.16 was applied to the principal of the loan, and they still maintained that she owed another 3000 I think $3,300 or thereabouts at the time when uh, she simply gave up and stopped paying because she had now paid, you know, about three times the, the 
fair market value of the vehicle and had not made more than more than two dollars of progress in retiring the principal. That's a little bit troubling to me. That's something I can write about. <laughs> um, so some thoughts about, about that. Uh, uh, I think that it does strike me that there is um, tremendous displacement of default gap fillers in that transaction. I've read that contract and a lot of them like that. And those contracts very frequently do displace to, uh, gap fillers to the, to the maximum extent possible. I mean, to start off, obviously there's a default gap filling interest rate that it's, if you don't specify what the interest rate is in your loan, well, that's obviously not what happened in this contract. There was an interest rate that was specified, but a lot of other provisions. So remedial provisions, obviously there was an arbitration clause. That's why it was not in court. It was in an arbitration. Um, uh, there, there was, there's also uh, permission given to um, monitor uh, 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 as asymmetric idiosyncratic investment of the lender by being able to monitor the consumer's credit history um, uh, and also uh, uh, the ability, some, some uh, car title lenders and subprime mortgage lenders are now affixing global GPS monitoring devices to the vehicles so they can track them down and kill switches so they can just press a button and uh, eliminate the ability of the borrower to move the vehicle. Um, so there's a lot of uh, default sort of get, getting out of the default gap fillers there. And then, uh, um, and then also, uh, uh, I think termination clauses, I mean, <laughs> You know, the, the borrower could obviously terminate by repaying the debt, um, but, and, the, and the lender can terminate by uh, no longer granting further modifications and whatnot. I'm not so sure that I have insights there. Um, and I should wind up, but I guess, I guess for me, um, uh, uh, there, there does seem to be some application to the notion that default, uh, default gap filling rules seem to have marginal relevance in that context. Uh, the lender has almost exclusive uh, authority and power to determine any terms of the agreement that it wants to and frequently does have complex long boilerplate forms that uh, 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 deviate from what you might normally expect if the parties were silent. Um, uh, so yeah, I think there might be some relevance there. But I guess stepping back, um, uh, uh, unlike uh, uh, the example of uh, businesses in supply chain contracts where the sense that I'm getting from the, the my, my sort of understanding of the of the literature th entirely through um, uh, Bill's paper that folks don't talk about it uh, about the law very much in that in that in that community my sense from uh, spending a lot of time talking to bankers both when I was a federal regulator but also as a professor I make it a habit to spend a lot of time talking to bankers and to and to sort of subprime finance lenders to understand well just to be, I think we're, I probably shouldn't be saying this since we're recording, but to know your enemy a little bit. Um, I spend a lot of time talking to them, and I think that they do think about the law an awful lot. And part of the reason uh, that, that although they are getting away from default gap fillers, they think about how far they can get away from default gap fillers before some of the outer boundary uh, um, uh, rules that come in and uh, supersede what the parties are willing to agree to by, at least in, in this view, somewhat illusory, con in this context, somewhat illusory consent. So I, 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 my fear is that the, the great failure in contract theory right now is not so much our ability to explain arm's length commercial transactions and whether or not default uh, gap filler rules are, um, are, are being sort of bargained away. I get that that's an interesting <coughs> project and I know there's a lot of really interesting uh, literature out there. You know, George Triantis at Stanford, maybe on a different side of the debate from Professor Whitford. I read that stuff a little bit and I'm excited about it, but I'm hoping that all of you at some point will come to, to answer what I think is a connected but hopefully, uh, unfortunately, more um, uh, pressing problem, which is the, the, the great problem of this mythology of consent. Because the, the client in that, that, that Navajo, uh, that lovely Navajo lady who just could not be more, uh, she was wonderful, uh, but she grew up on the Indian reservation in a single room shack. Uh, uh, and had managed to claw her way out of poverty, the deepest party, poverty, the epicenter of American poverty in the Southwest, a, a part of the country that is very much indistinguishable from developing countries around the world. Um, and, uh, uh, and 
she did not understand what an annual percentage rate was. She could not distinguish what you know an interest rate was as opposed to the principle of the loan. Uh, she had virtually no understanding of any term in the contract other than she got that if she doesn't pay, they're going to take the pickup truck. And that was the one asset she had. She had two, two, two things. She had a job where she made $11 an hour and the pickup truck. And after she paid $5,600, uh, they came to her place of business and were embarrassing her because she'd stopped making payment. They were going to try and take both of those two things. So I think that the great problem in our contract theory is the mythology that, you, that, that consent is something that is a valuable thing and that should be able to override those deep-seated problems in our economy. Um, all right, that's all I have. <laughs>
talk to us about the future. Second example is uh, New York real estate. There's two things, I mean, many people may know, co-ops and condos. Co-ops are a big nuisance. They have this thing called flip taxes, and the other neighbors can do bad stuff to you because it's not really real estate ownership. You own shares and there's a lease, whereas condos are actually real estate ownership. They cost a bit more. Everyone who's ever sold a co-op always says, never again, never again, because everyone, they've had to pay this big flip tax. Everybody's been such a pain. as they. But yet, then they're starting to look for an apartment. The, uh, uh, and the condo's a bit more expensive. They're a little harder to find. And the co-op, oh, we're sure we're going to get along with the neighbors later on. We're sure the flip tax isn't going to be applied to us. We're sure they're not going to uh, uh, second guess our choice of buyer. So those are just two examples of people who you try to get them sometimes to focus on the ex post, and you can't. Um, that gets to my last point, which relates to both of you. I'm completely persuaded, Chris, that the phenomenon of taking advantage of people uh, who are vulnerable but perhaps legally allowed to contract is a huge problem. I wrote a paper called Repugnant Business Models, which was precisely about that there are certain business models like this kind of lender payday loanee model, the examples I gave, uh, people in uh, nursing homes and somebody turns up who is a um, uh, who's a dentist and he does this extensive examination and then he writes to the next of kin, you know, this person really needs elaborate dental work. This is somebody who doesn't have much time left and barely knows where they are and they're proposing to pull out half their teeth and replace them with fancy new teeth. You know, and it won't cost you anything. I saw such a letter. This happened to my spouse's mother. You know, and it's like, What's this about? This is a repugnant business model. Casinos sending to people who've just gotten out of bankruptcy. Don't you want to come gamble with these free chips? There was also an extraordinary example, talk about getting angry, of uh, people who were uh, persuaded to sell on the cheap their lead paint settlements. A company's business model was you need an independent expert. The law thought of this. So they, they knew just the right independent expert for you. And this independent expert somehow uncannily always found that these ridiculously low amounts for the structured settlements, the money now, were just so fair and right when it was outrageously low. I, I mean, what I would like to see is not so much an integration of these two, but just a sort of here are the conditions under which people should not be, nobody should be taking advantage in some way that I'm going to define. Okay, now I'm going to be quiet. Sorry, too much stuff. No, that's great. Bill, yeah. do you want to respond? I want to make a couple of comments, just to both of them. Uh, look, of course, there's a lot of transactions where very, you call them repugnant business deals. They're, they're theft by contract, however you want to describe it. But you're not going to affect the content of those tra transactions by manipulating the default rules. What you want to do is to get rid of freedom of contract. Because whatever default rules you create will just be displaced in all these countries. Hey, you can't have default rules if you have people I, who you don't trust to I don't, not waive them. I agree with you. I don't argue with that. I'm all in favor of regulation, which is a way of saying displace default rules in the appropriate yeah. circumstances. Yeah. So, so our next question is from Josh Whipper. Okay, yeah, I felt like I needed to, to, to clarify. So to th um, given that it was part of this comes out of, uh, I guess, a dialogue between father and son, across the work and uh, there's a the, what the, there's a sort of a parable of the fisherman and the fish where at some point the fisherman asks the fish how's the water and the fish says what water in the sense that he has no sort of knowledge no knowledge of it right so it's about variation so the the question is in the, in the, well I did this research on supply chains back in the 90s and early 2000s that goes in that book was there any really discussion of law there is actually a couple anecdotes about lawyers there's one one quote about a lawyer where I'm talking to a guy in an OEM about disputes between customers between the OE and the supplier and I sort of say so what happens when there's a you know what happens when something goes awry and he said uh, well you know if it's if it's um, manufacturing they pay if it's engineering we pay and I said, are there disputes? He said, oh, there's always disputes. I said, and I said, so do you call on the lawyer? He said, oh, no, we don't cheat our suppliers. <laughs> um, I mean, literally, I mean, it's on tape. That's what he said. We don't cheat our suppliers, right? And, um, you know, it's because 
Yeah, it's, you know, there's another, some other things about these things. One of the things is, like, on, on sort of consent, on the, whether there's sort of consent in these contracts. Like, these are all, these are, in some cases, fairly oligopsonistic industries from the supply side. It's not that you don't have power, power as a supplier. Harley's chroming supplier actually has an immense amount of power. They have one buyer, but chrome's kind of important on a Harley Davidson, right? Mm -hmm. they were, there's, it's, it's, it's actually, that one's different, but a lot of the others, not so much. And every now and then, there are these cullings that happen in the in industries, and they, the OEs can shut these suppliers down, some of the smaller ones. What you've seen in the auto industry is a growth and sort of a, an arming back. And you see this sort of back and forth around with some of these very dependent companies, and at a certain point, they're just in, right? They may be bottom feeders, so if they get shut down, they may pay their workers like shit, so I'm not sure, you know, whether that's good or bad, it's a separate thing. But even there, you get some sort of stuff around power and, you know, like, hey, this is just the business. Um, the other thing I wanted to say about where things have gone and why I think there was part of what's happened across this literature in my world around the lawyers is that I was looking at a period where and this is still going on to some degree, but a period where stuff that used to be made in-house was made in companies, was made between companies, across companies, right? So the thing that I actually haven't seen quite, quite this way, but instruction manuals for coordination between companies, this aspect of standardization was, incre is, 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 was and is incredibly important, right? Where you can, if you think about a relation, these relationships going wrong, they can sort of go awry for, one of my co-authors has put the term, uh, there's sort of two problems. You, know, you can get screwed or there can be a screw up. And sort of which one it is, you don't always know. And the idea that you know, this sort of is going on, you're always contracting around opportunism or screwing. But actually a lot of the stuff that goes into these things comes out of the engineering side trying to stop screw ups. And some of these screw ups, it's, it's just this coordination across sorts of people. Like some of the stuff I'm doing, I'm doing a paper, uh, book about the Fiat Chrysler merger. One of the big issues that's going on there is trying to just figure out what the what, the, what they call technical norms are. A technical norm is how you design a particular thing. That's actually a part of a, of a, a purchasing contract, in a way, because it says you need to go look at that technical norm and you need to figure out who else you need to talk to. But that's internal to Fiat. That's, that has to do with Chrysler. And all those sorts of things are actually in the master supplier agreement stuff, which has to do with, and a lot of it's about process around design, who you need to talk to when, right? And that's. You, the sort of contracts you're looking at, like you're saying, you don't want to modify that stuff because you don't know who else is going to need to look at it, right? And that's a huge part of it. Um, but yeah, it has to do with like, they're establishing a way of contracting across time that's about coordinating their own stuff. A lot of that is going on in that period, right? And now there's some of the later stuff. I have more things to say, but I'll get to talk to them later. <laughs> Bill, you want to just say that uh, Josh's comment uh, enlightened me really to that the distinction between supply chain contracts and innovation contracts is not sharp oh, yeah. because many supply chain contracts now have a lot of innovation aspects as try to figure out ways to design parts more effectively. That's an important part of these supply chain relationships. So maybe when I separated them out, that wasn't quite right, although you certainly do have these other contracts that Brading and Matt Jenny John writes about, which are for inventing intellectual property from whole cloth. They're not really part of an exchange of goods. Yeah, one of the, just on that, one of the things about what Jenny John termination stuff, it's worth noting that the out in, in, the, in that paper that Matt's talking about is when you're talking about intellectual property and you're not as opposed to, say, a factory or a conventional joint investment, the value of intellectual property is partially in being able to deprive others from something that they could, join, in fact, could both be using. Right? I mean, like, this is really about just ring fencing an idea which has value only because you can't use it. Right? I mean, otherwise, who cares? Like, hey, you, we both know this thing, but only I get to use it. I mean, that's a particular sort of... You can of, use it, but you got to pay. Yeah, you got to pay. But I mean, like, it's, in a way, like, it's an idea, right? If we all use it, there's more, we have more penicillin. Nope. We have the same amount of penicillin, but I get all the money, right? Um, you know, it's generic drugs. A lot of it is about intellectual property. It's a very particular sort of property. Yes, it is. So well, I'm going to take the <clears throat> moderate... Oh, I'm sorry, Juliet, do you want to... Jump in on. I have one question. Well, I have a million questions because your paper is so thought-provoking. Yeah. But 
Um, so one of the things you say is that, um, first of all, you say in SFK contracts that if something is important, it won't be left unstated, okay? So that they will draft um, and they'll take care of it in the contract. And then you say later on, you know, that maybe consequential damages are not ideal or allowing buyers consequential generous ones are not, it's not good, but it's highly unlikely that such a change would offer contractual parties significant cost savings at the formation stage. Okay, so, so here's what I want to say. Um, in, in thinking about saving costs at formation stage, you think default rules really don't have much effect on saving costs at the formation stage, and they're not important there. But in, if you focus on one clause like that, right, which is generous consequential damages for buyers, um, you say, well, you know, it, it might be better not to have that rule, but it, gee, it won't save parties that much cost, right? But isn't the idea that you have lots of default rules and then you're going to get out of the ones you don't like. So in, in looking at cost savings, you can't just look at a particular clause. You're going to look at, um, you know, which, you know here, here are all the default rules and here's the one we don't like. Um, and some, somebody I interviewed in the manufacturing sector said, used the term wild, a warranty, indemnity, intellectual property, liability, and damages. And that's what we make sure is in our um, either MSA or um, and <laughs> or a purchase order, and we don't want consequential damages. So, in other words, in looking at the cost savings, it's which one you know we have you focus things so that you know which ones you don't want, and there's the cost saving. You have all the sh off the shelf rules, and then you have the ones you don't want. You're suggesting it could save some money if we did uh, make consequential damages either unrecoverable or more difficult. Well, I'm saying, but, look, most of the default rules will be useful, will save parties money, um, and then the ones that they don't want, then they'll expend the cost um, to, to get out of the ones that, that they don't want. Yeah, that's right. But I'm just saying it's not very costly to displace the buyer's consequential damages rule, although... Uh, you know, it, it's certainly not wanted in many, many circumstances. You could certainly flip the rule and put, have the rule that it's a default rule, you buyer can't get consequential damages unless the contract provides otherwise. But I don't, and I don't necessarily oppose that in, the, in this context. I mean, I'm not worrying about what the slippage would be in other contexts for now. But I don't think you're going to save a lot of specification costs that way, because I don't think the specification costs of flipping that rule now are very high. No, but the, the, you're looking at, the, the, it's not just the specification costs of that one uh, clause, it's, look, you have the benefit of all these default rules, and you get, and so that saves you specification costs, and then you limit your drafting costs to the ones you don't want. You know, that you opt out of them, and so... Well, I'm certainly not advocating getting rid of default rules, so that's not on the table, at least on my table. I, of course, we're going to have default rules, because there's going to be contracts where you have to turn to them. Certainly all the uh, battle of form situations, Julia. Uh, I, as I argued, I mean, if, if you're really worried about crowding out, a la Bob Scott, and I know you share my view that the evidence of crowding out is scant, uh, modest to say the least, I think it was my phrase. But if you, you know, one way to do that is just to eliminate damages completely. Then there'll be no crowding out of informal settlement. But we would want to do that, right? Because we want a default rule scheme that provides for damages. I argued in order to give somebody some, an arm up in, a, in facing with an opportunistic threat. In order for courts to have some kind of law to apply when they hit the battle of form situation and all the terms conflict, et cetera. Well, why is it that, for example, in one, why is it in these SFKs, if it's an important matter, you say that the parties will take care of it by contract, but that in the um, expectation or in the remedial defaults, they're not really um, contracting around it. They're not, you know, going to specific clauses on damages. They're not going to liquidated damages. 
Why is that? Uh, they're, that's, they don't think the payoff for having liquidated damages uh, Just is worth the it. Just because constraints, right. Yeah. So, so you're, you're saying, uh, I'm not saying that default rules don't have their utility. I'm not arguing that, which seems to me what you're asking me. I'm saying changing default rules within the range of reasonable possibility is probably not going to impact specification costs very much. Might, might modestly. Getting rid of all default rules, now that could have an impact on, uh, an adverse, perverse impact on specification costs. I agree with that, but I don't favor that. Others? Other questions? Um, all right, well, then I'm going to take the uh, moderator prerogative. I actually had, a, I guess, a sort of a question and sort of a comment. Um, um, there are two different things that um, come to mind um, about your paper, both having to do with audience. Um, one of the things that, um, so I teach this workshop on doing deals, and one of the, a guy that I teach it with always starts the semester by telling students, contracts, they are a narrative history of litigation. Now, I think if I understand the relationalist project, right, at least at the front end of contracting, the whole idea is that it is an anticipated narrative of trust. And so part of what I really like about your, and those are totally inconsistent stories about what the formalized version of the contract is doing. And I think that one of the things that is really valuable about your analysis is that it's showing that, that you, I think, get some traction in contract theory by breaking down the contracting process into these three steps. And in fact, the, you know, whatever we think we're getting as an economic benefit or any other kind of benefit from default rules is not going to be apparent at the front end, it may or may not have been apparent at the back end, but the whole point is that we're not thinking about that back end at the front end. And so I think that's great. I think that's really valuable. But audience, so the question is, you know, who, who, are, you, who are your readers, right? Who are you trying to persuade? Well, it's not going to be judges, right? It's not going to be legislators. It's not going to be lawyers. Um, so are you going to change, you know, Bob Scott's mind? Are you going to change Ron Gilson's mind? Like, I don't, I don't, I don't really know. You're not going to change anybody's mind here either because we already agree with you, I think, for the most part. So the, then the question becomes, well, what maybe you really want to do is provoke them into some kind of fight, right? Or at least to respond and say, okay, no, 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 actually, these costs are serious at the front end and we need to think about it. And I think that what they would say is maybe something along the lines of what Juliet is, is suggesting, which is, well, actually, what we're really doing is anticipating mistrust all along. And the real cost uh, that we're saving by specifying around default it, at the front end is the back end. Now, I think that that is factually inaccurate. I think that the whole point of a lot of that project, of the kind of contract theory project, is to deliberately ignore that reality. But I think that if I, were wor if I were writing this paper or thinking about how to provoke a response from that audience, I would, I would really run at that. Like, uh, you know, this is what you guys are, I think, trying to, how you're trying to model the world. And that world does not exist, at least in these contexts, maybe others. Second, audience. Um, so again, going back to this workshop that I teach, one of the, th the first things I say to my students after my you know, co-teacher talks about the horrors of litigation, which I think is sort of not true, um, is actually, who's the audience for the contract? Like, who is actually going to read this thing? And I think that's part of the story that you're telling, especially when you're thinking about the internal disciplining function within an organization. So what we talk about in this workshop that I teach is stuff like, well, OK, the parties themselves may read the contract. They may be the audience for the contract. Clearly, the lawyers are, right? I mean, I think that the lawyers and what I sometimes call the lawyering interest in all this is, is significantly underappreciated and I think is really important um, because I think that, you know, as trust fails, as there's a screw up or a screwing, we then care about external force. We care about external threats and the capacity to, you know, punish or whatever. And lawyers, I think, perform that kind of function in society. And the ability to kind of invite them in from the outside even if it's by reference to a formalized document to try to discipline folks either within the organization or outside, 
I think ends up being an important part of the story. I don't know that that tells you much about specification, specification costs at any stage of the analysis, but I think it means, to me at least, that part of the, the function here, the work that people are doing, the reason that people think it has any value at all is because it's, 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 it's not just creating an instruction manual, I think that was your term, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's creating a, a club, it's creating a threat that I think people don't necessarily just want to use against the other side, but they might need to be able to use within their own organization. And I, I don't know what, what Josh would have to say about that, but I think that's a part of it. On the other hand, right, who's another audience? Well, potential buyers or investors in the business, right? So in my workshop, it's all about investing in a startup. Okay, well, what does the startup have? Startup has, doesn't have much. Maybe they've got some contracts with their buyers. Well, who cares about those contracts? It's not litigants at all. Right? It's not lawyers at all. It's going to be somebody who wants to invest in the company. And one of the few sort of bits of reified evidence that they have any value is going to be this formalized thing. So this is a kind of roundabout way of saying that you know, there are many, and in your epidemic breach example, I think, might also be evidence of that, that down the supply chain, you need to be able to show, well, OK, goodness, if somebody further up the chain has screwed up, you know, they will, in effect, indemnify you down the chain, so you don't need it. like, don't worry about it. Um, so I guess the, 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 the and I, I don't, this is really more of a comment, I guess, on a, a question. First question is, like, who's your audience? The second is, I think that, the, that there are many different audiences for contract, and I think that the lawyers, you know, have their own view of what their role is in both constructing the audience and speaking to it. Um, and if, I, I guess I would think about both incorporating that into the analysis of, of you know, into your analysis and also into thinking about the different audiences that the lawyers are anticipating, if that makes any sense. So both the lawyer's interest and the lawyer's expectations themselves of readership. Yeah, I want to just, uh, it's a very good thought, John, Jonathan, and I thank you for it. And, and related to Claire's uh, comment about why we have written contracts as opposed to an exchange of memos, and it seems to me both uh, talk about, uh, appeal to me, and first thought on, on my part, they appeal to people using what I'll call the symbolic value of law for useful purposes. And not because litigation is going to happen, but in Claire's case, uh, you don't have to keep proofreading the contract or arguing with the other side because there's been a closing and it's done, so we can stop. Of course, you could have changed it, but anyhow, there's a useful function there. Uh, and in your example, when you're trying to uh, talk to the lower staff and so forth, and they say, why did you do it that way? Why don't we do it this way? Well, I'm sorry, it's in the contract. It's legal. And of course, it could be changed, and nobody's going to sue about it. But nonetheless, this can be a very useful kind of a thing. So we could, I'll call it symbolic, but maybe you could think of a better word. But it seems to me there's a relationship there between your two interjections. I just, I just want to respond to Julia and Bill on something. I mean, I, I take your point to be, uh, basically, given the present relational world, given the norms and the relational community, and given how contracts are presently negotiated, default rules are not doing much work at the specification stage. Yes? At the formation stage. Well, they're doing but I mean, they're not doing, can, yes. You can't, whatever the specifications right. are, you can't reduce them by just changing. Right. But I guess um, then I think I take Juliet to be saying um, that, in a sense, you're looking at kind of atomistically. Let me just make a comparison. I wrote a paper on why do German contracts do as much, uh, uh, how can German contracts do so much with so many fewer words? Mm -hmm. And what I gather, I mean, talking about reducing specification costs, they have incredibly elaborate default provisions, and their specification costs are Zippo because they just all take the default, then you may say, well, why don't they tailor more? And the answer at the time I wrote the paper was that these tended to be people in very thick reputational communities who went through the institutional ritual of we do this creature called a contract with the backdrop of the default rules, and then they did what they did. Now. Um, query whether, and I should find this out, how much that's changed given the increasing heterogeneity of contracting parties. At that time, mostly what one saw were what we would call strategic 
arrangements, again, I'm in the M&A world here, strategic arrangements rather than financial with people in comparable companies, and not only in comparable companies, in comparable geographic areas. So you can't, you can't run, you can't hide. And there, in theory, you could just sort of sign the thing and say, okay, we have a contract, and nobody would almost care what it said because the reputational bonds would be doing all of the work. Indeed, but it's got a little thing on Germany around master supplier agreement sorts of things. Um, yeah, in uh, when you have strong associations. So in this sort of debate, um, I actually think it's mentioned in there. But Gary Hergel, who works on customer supplier relationships in, in manufacturing stuff, has made the point that um, in an, in uh, supply chain stuff in Germany, the there's a lot of stuff negotiated at the sectoral level. So there's a supplier association bargaining with associations, you know, and they will set the sort of terms of trade. So it'll be something different from the legislature and stuff. But the, you know, the, the, the standard, the basic standard of contract and the rules are are bargained at that level, um, which means that the stuff you have to do individually is less. You know, so that's part of what's going on in a different context, right? But it's different than having it be, you know, some sort of national sort of thing. It's for the sector. It's freedom of contract, but set associationally with suppliers binding each other to try and stop low road competition. David, we have basically. that example in the real estate construction industry in this country where the American Association of Architect forms, as the contracts professors know, but it's kind of parallel where the rulemaking is not through default terms, and the rulemaking is through a kind of a public-private organization, in a sense. Um, 